Okay, we're recording. Okay, um, I would like to uh, call a meeting to order of the Finance Committee meeting for January 10th, 2023. And it's uh, now, I think, 10.03 a.m. And we have a quorum of the committee present. Um, pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 as extended, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom by uh, or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort being made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. And um, I need to announce and want to remind everybody that uh, this meeting is being recorded um, and uh, so that um, everybody is aware of that. Um, so I'm going to go through the committee um, to just make sure that all members of the committee can hear me and be heard and going alphabetically. Um, we'll start with uh, Lynn Griesner. Present. Bob Hegner. Present. Matt Holloway. Present. Bernie Kubiak. Present. Michelle Miller. Present. Uh, Kathy Shane. I'm here. And Alicia Walker. Present. Okay, so I want to thank everybody. Um, the one, let's see, I see that Sean is here and Amy is here. Um, so what I'd like to do is, um, first of all, see if there's anybody in the uh, public who would like to make public comment um, at today's meeting, uh, and if so, um, ask that they raise their hand. Seeing none, um, then uh, I think we can go on. I might ask for public comment again later if there are significant members of the public who appear. Um, and uh, I think it's okay at this point um, if you want to bring Councillor Haneke into the meeting from the attendee group. And so whoever can do that. Um, I, I sent a prompt, but um, she's okay. like a button. Um, so with that said, uh, the, um, what we're gonna do in the order of the agenda is start with water and sewer regulations and then go to the um, special act on residential property transfer fees uh, because uh, one of the co-sponsors, Councillor Devlin Gauthier, is uh, not going to be able to be present and we want to respect um, Amy Rusecki's uh, time since she's with us to uh, pursue that right away. Um, so, um, Sean, would you like to um, make any introductory um, comments about what your proposal is and explain the memo that you sent out? And for uh, just for the record, I also want to point out that um, uh, the packet um, that is available to the public um, has been expanded to include um, this item and all items that we're going to be discussing today. Sean, is there anything that you'd like to say in the introduction? Lynn, were you going to say something first? Yeah, would you like me to put the memo up? Uh, sure. Yeah, so uh, we put together this memo in response to this discussion at the Finance Committee at the last meeting um, to try to lay out um, the impact of the, or at least the estimated impact of the, the regulations and the shift in line ownership. Um, in you know going through that process and thinking about it more, we decided to recommend against uh, including that in the regulations at this time. We do want to move forward with the the rest of the regulations, but we think the 
the magnitude of the financial impact of that sh uh, shift is worth us exploring for a longer period of time before we adopt it. Um, so this memo lays out uh, sort of just the background. Um, you can go to the, the next slide, Flynn. So this chart um, provides the information that I think was requested um, by Kathy, which is to show sort of the rates and the trajectory of costs without um, the impact of the regulations, and then to show what it looks like with the impact of the regulations. Um, and so what you can see here is uh, the, the top chart is the, uh, the water enterprise fund and the bottom chart is the sewer enterprise fund. Um, both have rising operating expenses related to um, salaries and, and um, utilities and all the costs that go into the, those operations. Um, both are seeing uh, rising debt in the future related to uh, capital projects. In water, we have the Centennial uh, project, which is a large one, even with the, um, the grant we have through the state uh, clean water revolving fund. Um, we're still going to have an, a large impact, uh, a large increase in our debt obligation in the Water Enterprise Fund. Um, and in the sewer fund, we have the Gravity Belt Project, um, which, which is reflected in the proposed debt um, section. So we, we're seeing costs rise anyway. Um, and then the other thing that we want to monitor because it, we're not quite sure where it's going to go in the future is the projected consumption. Uh, so the projecting consumption levels uh, drive the rates pretty um, directly, right? So if the consumption is lower, the rates have to go higher in order to generate the same amount of revenue. Uh, so our rates dropped off quite a bit during COVID. We were hoping to see them bounce all the way back to sort of pre-COVID levels. We still haven't seen that yet. Um, so we're showing projected consumption uh, sort of conservatively at where it is now. Um, and for water, you can see it's even a little bit lower than what we budgeted for FY23. Uh, so you can see the in the light green, uh, the estimated rates um, with and without the uh, impact of the, the per estimated impact of the draft regulations. Uh, the other piece, if you go to the next uh, page, Lynn, the other thing we were looking into uh, based on the conversation um, at the last meeting was insurance and whether there is a program um, that could uh, reduce the cost or the impact um, in the enterprise funds and therefore reduce the, the pro projected rates. So we did talk with um, HomeServe USA, I believe it is, um, which is a pretty large uh, company that does this type of insurance. Our initial conversation, they were, um, they had sort of conveyed that they did think that there would be a program that would cover uh, the sort of preventative type replacement of water and sewer lines, the, the ones we were talking about when we would repave roads. Um, once they dug into the numbers a little bit more, uh, they came back and said they can't offer that program. Uh, so really the only insurance that we could get through them would be uh, coverage for unanticipated repair or replacement of broken lines and the cost in the water fund uh, would be about $150,000 per year. They charge based on the number of lines, uh, a monthly premium per line. And then in the sewer fund, it would be 310,000 per year. But again, that would just be for the unanticipated um, repairs and replacements. It wouldn't cover any of the proactive when we repave a road and want to address all the, the lines that are underneath that road. Um, so we think that the cost of insurance at this time likely not be, um, it, may, it may be something we still want to consider when we go down this road, but it might, we don't think it's going to reduce the cost um, overall. So again, in light of all that, the rising costs, um, uncertainty around consumption, rising financing rates, uh, we think it's better to hold off at this time in regards to that specific piece of the regulations um, and to do a little bit more exploration of that, try to get a better sense of how many lines in, uh, need to be repaired and replaced over the next couple of years. And then we'll also have better information on our consumption levels going forward. Um, and Amy can speak to some other elements or some other things that are in the works around um, drought regulations that might impact uh, our consumption numbers um, and some other things coming down from the, the state. Okay, Amy, uh, did you have a follow-up? Because actually what uh, Sean just said was exactly what my question was, whether the rate, uh, whether the consumption numbers might decrease as we implement uh, state regulations regarding encouraging uh, con conservation of water use. Yeah, and, and partly I know um, 
it, it's, we, we've kind of been saying for years, hey, when we get our new water permit, we know it's going to have some restrictions in there for water, non-essential water use during the summer. Um, we actually just last week, the state pushed forward um, regulations that is going to make that a reality um, much sooner than that, potentially even this summer. Um, and so, and they are, they're putting pretty strict guidance on what counts as essential water usage in these times and what doesn't count. Um, what this means for us is just that, you know, during the summer, more likely than not, most of the time we're going to be saying people can't water their lawns except for maybe one day a week um, and only outside of the hours of nine o'clock in the morning to five o'clock at night. Um, and, um, you know, so a lot of those usages, a lot of the summer usage that we get, um, that's going to be down in the future. Hopefully and, that answers uh, it. I don't know if you or Sean want to um, comment on how that might affect rates in addition to what's on the chart on page two. Yeah, I so think it's, go ahead. Oh, me, sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, I, I don't know that we know the exact number that it's going to come down. I think it's just as we're looking at projected consumption, even over the last several years, even taking COVID out of it, we've seen this decrease as people have been more and more conscious about how much water they use. Um, I don't know that we know the number, but I do think that that uh, projection consumption number is going to be a little lower, um, knowing that we have water use restrictions um, during many months, especially in the summer. And then talking with Amy and, and Guilford, Amherst is a little bit unique, we say that a lot, but um, a little bit unique in that the summer isn't necessarily where our greatest water consumption is. Um, obviously, the, the university and the colleges sort of depopulate over that time. Um, so, so it's just another wrinkle that we have to consider is that the summer months may not be our busiest time for consumption, but we're still going to have to deal with these regulations. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to start calling on other members of the committee now, but uh, my concern is, is that since we know that from prior presentations that you've made that the um, fixed portion of the budget, the cap, uh, just the equipment and capital and salaries um, is what drives it and not the consumption. So if consumption goes down, I assume that rates have to go up. Um, yeah, the water and sewer fund, I mean, it's sort of like, you know, when we talk about the schools and classrooms, right? So the things that really drive the cost in the water and sewer fund are how many sources of water you're managing, all the equipment that goes along with that. Um, and so, you know, the, the ways to make a dramatic change in the cost of um, in the water fund, for example, would be to, to have less water sources, but we're very... Uh, we're very cautious about anything that would reduce our water sources because it's going to, you know, we all consider that a pretty precious resource. Um, even if the state regulations say we can't use it, that's the problem. <laughs> um, but, but those are the ways you make dramatic changes in the, the cost structures of the water, and uh, the water fund in particular is the number of sources that we maintain and the equipment that goes along with it and the staffing that goes along with it. So I'm going to start recognizing other members of the committee with uh, questions and uh, the you may have bernie um th thanks andy uh, i i'm in general i'm in favor of postponing any decision about the uh the water main repair replacement repair because i think it's more important that we get those regulation other regulations in place um one question that i have is do the proposed rates cover any prospective capital improvements in other words, are we looking out when we do these proposed rates, are we building in a percentage in the rate that would go into a fund, uh, into the enterprise funds um, for the purpose of um, replacing those pains at some point? Because, um, you know, if we if we can anticipate that we're going to have to do something like that, it makes sense to me to start setting funds aside for it now in a, a, a maybe a modest additional increase in the uh, in the rates with the intent of setting that aside could be helpful over the over the future. I mean, one of the things that every town does is they they know that this is coming, but they don't plan for it or they don't act on it. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, if five years ago we started setting money aside, we'd be way ahead. And we may be a couple of years away from 
making any changes. So maybe we should start setting again a modest amount of money uh, aside for this purpose. Yeah, I, um, so it's a good question. So uh, under our current system, yeah. So if you look at this chart, um, if it's a large capital project that we're going to borrow for, it shows up in the debt or um, current or proposed section. Uh, but if it's sort of the year to year um, capital type uh, expenditures, we have that capital row, uh, which covers things like water system improvements and and those types of things. Um, to your point about, and so the chart we've shown here is what if we put aside, you know, five hundred thousand dollars per year, but we could adjust this to show if if we wanted to start to build up some type of reserve now. Um, you know, we could obviously modify this table to show what it would look like to do a smaller amount and then grow it slowly over time. Okay, Bernie, anything else? No, thank you. Okay, Kathy. Uh, thanks, um, and th thank you very much for this memo in the table. Um, I have uh, one question just to follow up on Bernie, um, and I don't need the answer right now, but you, Sean, you started to answer it with that capital line. My understanding is, and we've seen it in the budget, that we've we've got a reserve, and it's, you know, that we're carrying a reserve in each of these enterprise funds, Bernie, so we are drawing on some of it, so I think that's correct. Um, so that's just a question. Yeah, enterprise funds um, have retained earnings, which is similar to a reserve, so um, just like the, the general fund budget, uh, we have sort of guidelines for, with where we want that reserve to be because it's used in a similar fashion if there's some sort of emergency need um, or if our if our revenues to revenues don't come in you know as expected um, you know it hits that retained earnings account so but we do have a retained earnings in every enterprise uh, fund that we have so it just in the in the future when we're looking at rates it would be good to just see that table you know I have it from earlier times um so my other qu question is just purely a question the cost of the draft regulations is that just the if we did the repair have you in the top band there's some things we have to do anyway and Amy said you have you had said that had some impact so is the 3.4 percent increase the first bank does it include the everything else and then we're seeing separately the cost if we started taking on the repairs ourselves it's just purely a question on how I yeah understand. so um so the other thing outside of the the line ownership and Amy correct me if I'm wrong um but the other thing outside the line ownership that will have a cost that I that we're not proposing we delay is the ownership of the water meters um for the larger uh, users. And I believe the way we're going to uh, propose addressing that is through some changes to the fee structure. Um, you know, there's that the flat fee for the meter fee. Um, and Amy has done an analysis of what we would have to modify that to to cover the additional costs of replacing those meters over time. So um, that we're not proposing a delay to. Um, we, would, we would keep that in the, the regulations. So is that included in the 3.4? I'll just say on the water line. So when I'm it looking at it's not included here yet, but it wouldn't um it wouldn't it affect wouldn't, it wouldn't affect everybody because it would be just for certain um meter types. Okay. Um thank you for that. And then my last one is around the meter size. We I feel like I I say this each time, but we talked about should we should we or could we, and what would the impact be, charge on those quarterly rates on meters? Could we go up on the larger meters, the 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 big user meters like UMass, Amherst College, whatever, um, as a, a way of regularly recouping some capital costs? So I don't need that now, but that analysis was one of the things we were going to look at um, to protect us against uh, the insulate us a little bit more on the uh, fluctuation on use mm -hmm. um, and trying to avoid hitting the households you know the 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 people who have the small meters the small i'm i'm using not very good technical terms but little little ones <laughs> i get what you're saying kathy <laughs> thank you um, I can, I mean, I can, I can address that a little bit. And I guess that's, it's a bigger conversation, you know, obviously 
you, you guys guide, <laughs> you know, like we can give recommendations and you guys tell us what you want to do. Um, what, what I was proposing for the meter rates was essentially looking at the meter size, how often it has to be replaced and any additional annual maintenance, and then just breaking down, here's the cost per year for that um, meter. And right now with our current rates, because the town only owns below a certain size, those quarterly rates make sense with, you know, this thing gets replaced every 40 years and here's the cost for a replacement and there's kind of no additional maintenance. With the larger diameter, because the town hasn't owned it, um, they have a higher replacement cost. You know, we do annual calibration on them because if they're off, you want them to be on and then there's typically a little bit of repairs. And so that's where that cost has gone. Um, it's looking to recoup the cost, but um, we were purely looking at how do we break even on the meters. So what the town is going to incur in costs of this change get passed along to um, the, 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 the owners of those meters. Okay. Um, they're still so paying for it. They're just paying us to maintain it rather than us relying on them to maintain it or replace it. So um, that that is you guys can certainly go beyond that if you know if you want to okay. um, change the cost structure there. Thank you. Hey, uh, Guilford, I noticed you had your hand up a minute ago. Do you, did you have anything to add at this point? No, no Amy got it. The, the meter the meter rate or meter rental charge is just to replace meters. It has nothing to do with trying to um, balance payments for the big users versus the small users. I, I think partly, Kathy, what you're getting at is like the thought of um, looking at rate structures in general, um, whether it's a tiered rate structure, whether, you know, business rates versus residential rates. And I think that's a conversation that I know you've been pushing for for a while and, and you know, um, se separate but equally important, I think, you know, because um, there's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, and even as you're suggesting, um, a lot of different ways to kind of make, you know, split who pays what so that we still recoup what we need. Okay. And uh, Bob, and then I wanted to see if, they, if uh, Lynn had questions because she can't raise her hands while she's uh, showing. But Bob? Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. The first is, um, you know, you you list three different scenarios on the top of page three. Uh, is the town covering the costs for two and three now, or does the town uh, charge the owner of the lines for these replacements for two and three? Um, Amy, correct me if I'm wrong. Two, we don't we're not proactively doing that right now um, when we resurface roads. So um, there may be, if they, I'm sure if they come across broken ones, they probably replace yeah. those or to, uh, report it to the owner. Um, but it's not a significant cost right now under our current system. Um, and Amy, maybe you can weigh in on number three. Yeah, well, and I'll say even too, like, yeah, most of the time we're not doing that. There are obviously exceptions where um, where we do replace, um, but typically it's only if we're replacing the water line, then what attaches to the water line may be replaced when we're um, doing construction. Um, number three, th these are new regulations that don't impact us now, but are going to impact us in the next few years. And so, you know, right now we aren't proactively replacing um, any service lines that are known or suspected lead containing, um, but there are going to be regulations in the near future that um, that are going to force us to to do a little a little more on that. Okay. Um, the the second question I have, and 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 Sean, maybe you can answer this. I don't know, but in your conversations with the insurance companies, did you get any rates for the actual homeowner what they might have to pay in order to insure their water lines and their sewer lines? So um, I didn't get, they can certainly provide that to us. They provided us two types of rates. They provided us um, from the main to the right of way. And then they provided us a rate if we wanted to cover it all the way to the house. Mm -hmm. um, so we did get 
you know, the additional increment if we wanted to cover the whole thing. I'm not sure if I can take that increment and say this is what it would be for um, an individual homeowner. Paul, you may have gotten the rates because you had a separate conversation, but um, but we could get that information, um, Bob. And we will. I think that's part of our plan is to communicate that information out um, to to residents so they could opt to uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. Paul, so if I can jump in on that, so yeah, so they there. This is a company that offers this program to municipalities. What we do is that. They ask us to um, mark, help them market it to their to the customers, <laughs> and then uh, for some I don't have the number in front of me, but it's like hundred bucks a year or something like that. They'll do the the water line, sewer line. They'll even offer you coverage for all your indoor plumbing if you'd like. They can insure anything, obviously, um, but this is a standard program that the National League of Cities um, brands, and then they offer it. This company offers it to any city or town. What they do is they contract with local contractors to do the repairs if it happens. And that's the, the sort of setup. I can get those numbers for you though. I have those somewhere. Yeah, I think it would help be helpful for residents to know, you know, what it, what would it cost to protect themselves against these unanticipated costs? Yeah, so, so I think it is something that was raised actually by one of the counselors before and we, we got the numbers and I think we can, um, if, if this, I think given this conversation, it was something we would sign up for and get that into everybody's mailboxes, basically. Great. Thank you. So, um, Lynn, Lynn, did you have anything? Yes. Um, so I just, I want to make sure I'm stepping back from this and saying, based on everything we're now seeing, the recommendation is that we go in ahead and pass the regulations and the bylaws and but we not change ownership of lines meaning from the main line to the property line as we've been discussing would somebody just confirm that i'm understanding that yeah so that's what the what we're proposing um it's not you know and talking with amy she'll have to go through and and if this is what the finance committee wants to recommend, she'll have to go through and and uh, modify the the draft regulations to show what it would mean because it's not a it's not a one sentence change. There's some uh, ripples throughout the regulations that she'll have she would have to update. Um, but if if again she can do that, I think she's already started taking a look at it. If um, if that's what the finance committee wants to recommend. Okay, my second point, and then I want to go to just a third thing. My second point is my assumption is that with all of the noise out there about aging infrastructures, we're going to be seeing some federal and state programs that we may benefit from regarding sewer and water. That's just a statement. We don't know for sure, but as Bernie said earlier on, this is something it's it's one of the hidden problems in every municipality that has these services. And so I want to just go back and re and say, I totally agree with Bernie. I think a modest rate raise to start having more reserves for the big projects that we could be seeing would be useful. And the time to do it might be this year, starting this year because we're not going to be doing, uh, if we follow the recommendation, we're not going to be doing the uh, big, if you will, the big jump this year. Beyond that though, what I think this has been most useful about, and I know we have spent enormous amounts of time on water and sewer, is we now have regulations that we're gonna propose we now have bylaws we're going to propose. We now know a lot more about what our water and sewer funds look like. And we've started to have that discussion about the um, critical nature of this hidden infrastructure that is aging. And I just want to thank DPW, Amy. Uh, I want to go back and thank Anna because of all the work she did with TSO on this. And Sean, you just continue to impress me with how you jump into any subject and understand the finances behind it. So, well, this is this is all Amy so here. So, th I, I yeah. support your <laughs> thanking Amy for all the work she's done on this. Yeah. Can Can I just address one 
one comment that you made, Lynn, mm -hmm. um, it about all that money out there. I know there's a lot of federal funds that are coming on stuff. And at least my understanding right now is how the state of Massachusetts has decided every state is allowed to allocate it differently. And the state of Massachusetts has decided to allocate it all through their um, SRF program, um, the state revolving fund program. And so um, it, it just means that it's, um, at least in Massachusetts, as compared to other states, it's um, it's it's going to be a little harder to get our hands on that because you have to go through this competitive application process, and it does have to be discrete projects, mm -hmm. um, and there's a point ranking system and and stuff like that, and so it's just not going to be as accessible for some of the, you know, little maintenance projects everywhere. That's just how the state's deciding to um, funnel the money. So ju just kind of FYI. Um, so I do so far. That's useful, Amy, and, yeah. and especially to know that we probably shouldn't count on that. Um, I have two other, qu one question and one other um, just observation on process. The one question is how much of our water and sewer money annually is uh, paid for by our higher, ed, our higher ed institutions? Is it 30%? Is it 50%? Um, I can, so they, so they pay the same rate as everybody else. Um, so it really just comes down to what percentage of our, um, consumption they are, which I can get you that in a second. The reason I, I, I feel like they're between 25 and third, you know, between a quarter and a third, um, is UMass. And then I don't, I don't think I have the, the kind of rough numbers for Amherst college in Hampshire. So I, and the reason I bring that up is because anything we do to these rates means our higher ed institutions are also contributing to our infrastructure. And I just want to make sure that we appreciate that, but also recognize that the cost to residents gets, you know, it's, yes, it increases as well, but the higher ed institutions also bear that same price cost. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to just mention is that TSO has made a recommendation that would differ from the finance committee. So this will have to go back to TSO. Um, and Lynn, on your question. So in the past, the university and colleges were a much larger percentage of our consumption. A lot of our declining, uh, a lot of what we're seeing in declining con uh, consumption is related to the university and colleges. I think just putting in more efficient systems as they put on new buildings. Um, so they used to be north of 40 percent um uh and fy 20 which is sort of pre-covid uh they were about 30 percent so um they are still a significant portion of our of the yeah. revenue but it's but it's getting smaller okay thank you okay keeping going uh, but actually athena you had your hand up so i wanted to yeah, Lynn just mentioned that it would go back to TSO. My understanding of the process would be that the recommendations from each committee go to the council and the council makes a decision from there and the committees would re-review. That's what we had discussed in the past. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing uh, a little bit later. Um, as uh, the one person who's a member of both finance and TSO, um, I probably will report this at the next TSO meeting uh, for information purposes. And if they decide to revisit their recommendation as a result, that has to be a decision, I think, of the uh, majority of the commit that committee. Was also, was this, did GOL finish? They've done the they've done the water regulations, but not the sewer regulations yet, and they haven't done the bylaws yet. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I have another question, but I'm going to save it because I want to honor other people. Bernie? Um, well, one of my favorite observations is deferred maintenance means broken. So um, uh, my thanks to, uh, to, to, to Amy and to Guilford and to, to Sean, our uh, master of the spreadsheets here, uh, for, uh, for focusing in on this and, uh, and, and keeping at it. Uh, and I, I think Amy's observation is correct. That is, the federal money trickles down uh, into the state. Um, this is considered small stuff and they're not likely to not likely to fund this. So as we look at what we can get for the big stuff, we should continually look to see how we can offset funds or offset expenses to 
put against the uh, uh, put put against this replacement. So thanks. Kathy. I think I'm about to say, I don't want to repeat what Bernie just said, but um, I didn't neglect it to say I'm totally in support of the recommendations in this memo. And I thank you for putting it together. I would just like to be able when we push, bring it back to the council to add what Bob has asked for that uh, there, there is an insurance fund and residents can do it. So we're not just um, sweeping it under the carpet. And then my only other observation, Bernie, on your that the federal money trickles down to the state or that comes to the state and then it trickles down to us, whichever. Um, I am I know none of us really know what's in IRA um, in terms of what water sewer infrastructure stuff could be built, but I think we all, we just need to be on the lookout whether some of the bigger stuff, um, there, there might be other sources of money to this giant thing that doesn't yet have regulations written to it. So just to keep it on our radar screen. That's, that's a comment rather than asking anyone to do anything. Thank you. Paul? You're muted. Just to go back to the um, question about how much the cost is. Um, so for external water line, it's uh, $6.75 a month. Um, for external sewer line, it's seven dollars and seventy-five cents a month. For in-home plumbing, it's nine dollars and ninety-nine cents a, a month, and there's a limit eighty-five hundred dollars per call. Um, so that's what gives you a framework for how much those sewer, those insurance programs cost. So there was one other thing uh, that I had thought about, I don't know if it's, if it's feasible or not, so I just wanted to ask, and that is uh, part of the problem that um, homeowners who suddenly have a huge expense because they suddenly have to um, do a major replacement of their line is, you know, the that they have to absorb it in an, as an unexpected expense in the budget. Is there any thought that's ever been given or any examples of other municipalities that have uh, allowed people to pay that additional increment over time without interest to uh, 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 ameliorate the effect on the individual homeowner who's uh, bearing that expense? Do you mean, Andy, if the town were to pay for it and then finance it for the homeowner yeah uh, and add to the bill over time as opposed to uh, what having them just pay it mm -hmm. um, I'm not I'm not familiar with any uh, system like that but Amy or Guilford have you heard of that I mean it's something we could certainly again look into um, as we go forward if there's a you know we don't want to necessarily be in the collection um, business on, in, a, in a new area, but um, it's something we could explore. So are there other questions that uh, anyone has from the committee at this point? If not, um, is there anybody who wants to make a, a motion <laughs> Kathy, go ahead. I, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to word it, Andy, but um, thank you. We have this memo, so I make, uh, I guess my motion is that, uh, that to approve the recommendation that we move ahead with all the other regulations, but not the town taking over the, and then I need wording on what that is. <laughs> Uh, so in other words, we want to recommend to the council yes. the um, the no change the in ownership of the water and sewer lines or something like that. Yes. 
we want yes. to recommend to the council not to change the ownership in water and sewer lines at this time. At this time. Does that capture yes. people? Yes, it does. Okay. Okay. So you made that motion I second. Right. <laughs> Thank so, you. Liz. So it's, uh, Kathy's made the motion and Lynn has seconded. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially a motion to recommend to the council that the council adopt the bylaw and regulations, except for the sections that change ownership of the line from the main to the property line. And uh, I think what we said in our last committee report on the subject to the uh, council. Uh, was that it is possible to adopt um, the bulk of the bylaw and regulations and to postpone uh, consideration of a section, which I think is essentially what the recommendation is to put it off for two years and then come back to it and revisit. Sean? Amy, you know the, the regulations uh, inside and out. Can, can you just not ex adopt a section or is it better to adopt the regulations just without the change um, in ownership? I mean, you, you, I, I, I don't know that you'd want the right, it's not as easy as just, we're not gonna adopt this section. Cause like I said, there's trickle down effects other places. Um, I think I would need to take a pass. Like I, I basically would need to take a pass at the regs and update language. Um, so there might need to just be a different, a different version. Um, I don't know if that like process wise, if that's the way to go, but I, it's not as easy as just adopting or not adopting a section. Cause there's, there's, there's modifications elsewhere, not just in the ownership section that will be impacted. Um, and I think you want change. it to be, I think you want the regulations to be clear about where the ownership is. You want to have the ownership right. in the regulation. So I think it would be probably better to say to adopt the regulations without the change in ownership and uh, to be provided by um, Department of Public Works. They can provide that version. Uh, Athena? Thanks, Sandy. I was just gonna suggest um, that the council have an initial conversation to, because there are gonna be conflicting um, recommendations from the two committees. Um, so it might be helpful to have an initial conversation about where the council wants to go um, before Amy does the work of, of all of that so that everyone kind of is in agreement before um, Amy goes through with all of those changes and then we can present kind of a clean version once there is agreement. That would be my suggestion. That well, makes what sense. I was thinking about doing, and I think we're, maybe working into a solution along similar lines is that uh, I was going to uh, talk to the chair of the committee, who's currently Anika, and uh, another member of the committee who worked closely with Amy, which, who's Anna, and uh, uh, tell them about today's meeting and um, what's uh, where the finance committee is, and then uh, see what they want to, um, what their suggestion is on the TSO side. Because, uh, you know, this is just new information that was not available to TSO. We don't know what TSO would have done with the information had they had it. And, um, But I think that the motion is clear enough that it expresses where the finance committee is based upon information that we have as a committee that was not available to TSO when it was considering. I agree, Th that works too. And, and I'll speak with Anika this afternoon about the next TSO agenda. I can bring that up with her as well. Okay, because I, I don't know where we stand with uh, meeting this week, I think is a decision has to be made today. Um, so we have a motion on the floor. Um, does, is everybody clear on what the motion is or 
Do we need it uh, read back by the minute taker to make sure that uh, he has it the way that we think it should be? Bill? Yeah, you want me to, can you hear me? Yeah, what do you have? Yes, I do. Uh, yeah. Can you read back exactly what you have written down for the minutes? And then I want um, uh, the maker of the motion, Kathy, and seconder, Lynn, to just say that, yes, that's right. And then we're going to proceed to a vote. Uh, Shane moved and Griesemer seconded to recommend to the town council that they approve the recommendations that there be no change in the ownership of water sewer lines at this time. Yes. Okay, we have consent. So, yep. thank you. Uh, so, uh, that is the motion that's on the floor. And uh, if any other discussion, I'll look for hands for about uh, 10 seconds. And if not, I'm going to call for a vote. Seeing no hands. Um, I'll go again alphabetically as I have been. Um, so, Lynn? Aye. Bob? Support. Matt? I'm going to abstain. Uh, Bernie? Concur. So, it's a support. Um, Michelle? Abstain. Kathy? Yes. I'm a yes. Uh, Alicia? She and Alicia unmuted, but I didn't, I don't think we heard anything. Yeah, I don't know. Alicia? Do you have a vote on the uh, motion on the floor? She can raise her hand twice for yes, once for no, and three times for abstain. <laughs> That's an abstain. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I don't know if that actually counts as a vote. I was, I was joking. But... <laughs> yeah. Pretty clear. Alicia, are you able to uh, confirm or? I'm going to ask a question right now. Um, is I have the vote, um, the thing that I think that Kathy and I and Lynn voted yes, so that's three votes and um, two abstentions from the voting members so that the motion would pass. And then the support of two of the members uh, who are non voting. So I think that that means that the motion has passed. Yes. Okay. So. Um, is there anything else that people uh, from the committee that the committee wants to ask of um, Guilford or Amy at this point? If not, uh, we should let them get on to their other work. Can I also um, just, Alicia was having trouble with her sound. You might need to go to the far left. And I know if it's not muted, but push the arrow and make sure that you're using the microphone array and your, your speakers. I because other I have I'm not the technology person, but that's the best I can do. Yeah, it's it's same as your system is the thing you want to cl click is is the easiest, Lynn. Okay. Um, but either of those, if you're still on the one from last night, we switched, we left the computer audio. So anyway, so Alicia is, uh, we see her unmuting, but there's no sound coming out. So Right, and she doesn't know why we can't hear her. Yeah, um, I think if you go, there's a, in most of our uh, 
Zoom programs next to the microphone, there's a small arrow on the left, lower left. And I think when you click on that arrow, you get to the microphone selections. So now she's she's going out and maybe coming back in. Okay. So in any event, um, I think that the uh, basic question was uh, whether there's any uh, additional questions of Amy or Guilford. And I have seen none. So um, I want to thank yeah. both of you. Andy, she has her hand up and she just connected to audio. Okay. So maybe we tested okay, it. Okay, hold on just a second. Lisa? Hi, I just wanted to see if you all could hear me now. Yes, yes. we can. <laughs> okay, I I'm not sure what just happened, um, but I'm hoping that my vote counted. You all got it right, so um, I appreciate your patience here. We so you, voted, you voted abstain, correct? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, that is how it is recorded, Alicia. Um, so the last question was whether there are any additional questions that members of the committee have of um, Guilford or Amy. Otherwise, we're going to let them get on to other things, and we're going to move to to our second agenda item. A so, big thanks. A big thanks to all of so you. So thank you, Guilford and Amy. I appreciate it. And, well, and I'll, uh, I'll just say like, you know, two things. First, Andy, if um, if you guys need me at TSO, like I'm happy to continue to be as involved as I need to be to keep moving this forward. We all know this is my baby. Um, so just let me know. Um, and the other thing, like even if I do have to say, rejigger the regs to change the ownership thing, knowing that this is going to be a conversation, all that effort to make the regs say this isn't going to be lost because I have a feeling we're going to come back. And the fact that we had this set up this way, you know, um, it'll make it easier, you know, if, if, you know, ultimately that decision is changed. So I don't want anybody being too overly concerned about how much work because it's not lost work in this process, I don't think. So. Okay, well, thank you. I of course, I can't predict what uh, uh, TSO is going to want, and uh, I think you're likely if to hear if you hear from somebody on the committee, it'll be Anna. Okay. I guess. Thank you. I'll okay. keep you posted on the on the TSO agenda, Amy. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So uh, we're ready to move on to our other item. Yeah, we. Definitely need to make sure. Let me go back and look at the uh, listing of attendees now. Uh, could you bring in Anna and Mandy? Because they need to be part of this meeting now. Okay. Mandy, can you hear us? Uh, can you confirm your? I'm present. And Anna. Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Okay. Uh, and I'll talk, I can talk to you later because it's now an unrelated subject, but I don't know if you caught what was going on with the last portion of the meeting. I came in right at the end, so I was planning to, to call you after and catch up. Yes, please do so. You, um, Thank you. Yeah, that'll be easier. Um, Okay, so we're now going to um, switch to the um, second subject of the of the two main items, which is the proposed special act on residential property transfer fees. And um, the first part of the discussion, I would I think, is the just general questions that came up, and um, I sent to you. Um, uh, the list of questions, which I had uh, provided also to the two co-sponsors. And uh, I think that Sean, you had looked at it and uh, concluded that there were only two of the questions that had any bearing on um, staff ability to respond to. And uh, the to the- yeah. Why don't you talk about the answer? Uh, just say what you need to say about those two. Sure. So the um, so the 
Question number two, can the assessor's office incorporate expected revenue from a property when making evaluation? Um, the short answer is yes, but there are some, you know, th there's a lot more context to that response. And that's gonna be the discussion um, on Thursday with uh, CRC uh, that has also been scheduled as a finance committee meeting starting at 5.30, I believe. So, so the full response to that question will be um, Thursday at 5.30 and the assessor will uh, have a presentation on that. And then the second part was um, the piece about the homestead. Um, the question about how many properties in Amherst are owner occupied without a homestead exemption. Um, so I just asked the assessor uh, two seconds ago um, if we have that information and the town does not. So we would have to request uh, submit a request to the Registry of Deeds to find out, um, A, to find out, can they provide that information for every um, home in, in Amherst? And then we would have to sort of go through a process to figure out which ones are owner-occupied or not owner-occupied. Um, so the the answer to that question is, is we don't have a quick way of doing it. We would have to do some research and work with the Registry of Deeds. Okay, and the, the other one that I had, um, mentioned was question nine. I didn't, um, what I said in my response when to Sean when he brought it up was his possibility that Paul may have additional comments about the relationship with our legislators mm -hmm. and that um, therefore they might. But otherwise, uh, uh, let's, uh, maybe I'll see if uh, Mandy or Anna have um, any responses to other questions that, and how you would like to proceed to uh, respond to those questions. I guess our question would be, do you want us to just go down the questions um, or have committee members ask specific ones that they're still curious about? Because we can just go down and answer some of them if that's how you want us to proceed. Uh, I'll, unless, a, unless I see a hand go up from a member of the committee with uh, a request to do something different, I think we should just go through the questions uh, in order uh, because they were provided by committee members. And uh, it was uh, a matter of trying to get the information, get the questions to you in advance and to the staff in advance. And then uh, if there are additional questions that uh, committee members have, um, after we do that, then we will turn to the committee if, and ask if there are additional questions. Okay, Anna, do you want me to just sort of go through and then you can add anything I miss? Yeah, that'd be great. I'm I'm in the car, so I don't have the document up. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so question number Thank one. You. Question number one was whether we could seek legislation that would enable the council to adopt a bylaw that may vary from specific language of that legislation. So our belief is that no, we can't, if the legislation passes, if the special act passes, any bylaw we enact has to conform to that legislation, just like any bylaw we enact has to conform to any state law. We can't contradict it. Um, it's one of the reasons though, that we are seeking a special act that is um, as general as possible so that it gives us as much leeway as possible in any future bylaw we were to adopt. Um, so that we have, you know, as, as much flexibility as we can, any mandatory exemption we put in a special act must be in a bylaw, can't be changed unless we go back to the legislature. So we only wanna put any exemptions in the special act that we are sure we would never want to change. Um, or that we think are necessary for the special act to pass would be another way to say it. Um, also, um, similar to similarly, any distribution that we put in a special act can't be changed. Um, so if there's some way we would want to dis distribute it that maybe in the future we want to change, we want it general in the special act and specific in the bylaw. Um, are there any questions on that before I move on? See none. Sean answered question number two about the assessor's office. Uh, we'll talk about that at CRC on Thursday. Um, question number three was about um, when tax changes, that there's studies out there that when tax changes um, 
increase, well, when tax rates increase, um, rents tend to rise to absorb 80 to 90% of those tax payments. Um, and the question then was, what mechanisms are put in place to avoid landlords passing the transfer fee on to renters? And so again, that's a bylaw issue. That's not necessarily the special act issue. But, um, and so we would say that needs more study or potential more research at the time a bylaw would be enacted instead of right now. But um, property tax changes are yearly changes um, is, is one response we would have. Whereas, you know, when our property tax rises every year on our own homes, or on the rental properties in town, that rise in costs is every year, a yearly expense, um, like a mortgage or like that property tax. But the fee we are proposing under the special act is a one-time fee. Um, it's similar to a fee you might pay in closing costs to, you know, the, the to, to uh, you know, to, it, I think I had fees to, pay for the oil in my tank. I had fees to pay for the registration of the deed. I had fees to pay the attorney. Those were one-time fees. And so we are not sure that one-time fees would be annually put into a rental payment versus that mortgage payment over 30 years is figured out a way to put in over 30 years. Um, mortgage, well, mortgage is a yearly expense, but but a one-time expense can be distributed over 30 or 40 years or absorbed. And we just don't know what would happen with that. Um, similarly, is that's our similar answer to the number four question, which is about commercial rents. Um, is there any evidence that tax increases on rental properties affect rents on those properties? So yearly tax increases that are expenses incurred year after year, the assumption is that they do. But um, a one-time fee, like we are proposing in the special act, may or may not be absorbed um, um, by the landlord or may or may not be passed on. That's a lot harder to determine. Um, so those are answers basically to questions three and four. Andy. Yeah, the, the only thing I want to point out is that uh, when I looked at the two studies, the uh, MIT study, which was from another member of the committee, had uh, sent that in. <clears throat> it uh, was focusing on the commercial rents. And uh, so that's where the, that those numbers came from a study that was focusing in that direction. Um, then I looked at the uh, to see if there were other studies that had to do with residential which is where the K-State um, study, the one that's uh, the second uh, listed link has to do with uh, the subject of residential. Uh, but I think what you're saying in combination um, after that clarification is still that um, both of them were talking about not real estate taxes, but one-time transfer fees, and that that applies to both. Bernie? You muted the... Yeah, yeah. Um, right. The, I mean, the, the, the MIT study was, uh, the answer to the MIT study is, is actually maybe, because any landlord who's in a competitive in a, or in a strong enough position is going to try to get a net at least where all the property tax increases are absorbed by the uh, by the renter, and again, this is related to a commercial property. Um, and if you have a net net lease in a commercial property, you can get preferable uh, rates on the borrowing and the like. Um, it doesn't. Uh, it it doesn't. Again, it doesn't impact a one time fee on a limited range of residential properties. Uh, the second the study, the Kansas one was kind of interesting because it sort of proves that it's cloudy when it rains. Uh, you know, when you raise real estate taxes, you're going to raise you're going to raise rates. And again, this is a one time fee. And what it overlooks is, you know, this is a study of, of a number of communities in the Midwest. Uh, college towns have uh, a somewhat different 
I just lost my notes here on my screen. Uh, college towns have a little bit of a different economy to them. Uh, property, residential properties in college towns typically, typically carries about a 10% premium over non-college towns. Um, and college towns with lots of conservation property have another premium. So it really doesn't address the, the Amherst market. And again, this is not an ongoing expense, it's a one-time fee. So these were nice fines, but not relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, some of this will come back up in the, the third discussion on Thursday um, when we meet together with CRC. The uh, whole question has come up because of you know the one suggestion that we look at this um, and it, you know it's really it goes be a little bit beyond just the transfer fee discussion. So going back to Mandy, we're on to question five, I believe. Question five. Um, and question five was about whether this is double taxation because Massachusetts has a real estate transfer tax um, or known as a deed recording tax in some instances paid to, well, paid at the time of um, sale. I'm not sure exactly. I think it's paid to the registrar registry, um, but it goes to the state. And so, you know, our response to that is it's not double taxation from the point of view of, you know, not allowable double taxation in the sense that we have meals taxes, lodging taxes, um, cannabis taxes that all have both state taxes and local taxes on them. Um, and so if this were to be considered a tax, we would respond that it operates in the same manner that meals, lodging, and cannabis taxes do, where the state authorizes the town to adopt a local option tax. And that's what essentially our special act is asking for, is asking the state to allow us to opt into a local uh, transfer fee. Call it a fee, call it a tax, but it would be allowed by the state um, in the same manner that the other local taxes we've opted into um, have been. Which takes me to number six, which the question was, um, should the voters need to vote on this? So those lo local option taxes are adopted by the town legislature. Um, I think in a town meeting form, they might have actually been adopted by the select board, not even the legislature, but nowadays they are adopted by the town council. The town council adopted, I believe, the cannabis local option tax. We would adopt the local option meals and lodging if there were any changes to that. There are other proposed local option taxes at the state level right now that if they passed, it would be up to the town council to adopt or not adopt them. Um, as the town's legislature. And so our response to question six is that um, this special act would be treating the transfer fee the very same way uh, state laws treat local option taxes on how they're adopted. And frankly, how other fees in town are adopted. It's the town council that adopts most fees in town, um, including you guys were just discussing the water and sewer rates, fees in some sense. Um, you know, and without necessarily a vote by the voters. So any questions on our responses to items five and six? Seeing none, I'll move on to number seven, which was about an owner who is owner occupying for a while and then they move out and then create a rental for a number of years. Um, and there was a question about, is there a grace period during which that rental property is treated as an owner-occupied property? Um, so our special special act for the transfer fee would apply only upon transfers. So if the property is never sold, um, the fee is never paid. Whether or not the bylaw that would have been eventually be adopted would say you should pay a fee. If you don't actually transfer the property, there is no fee. Um, so a, if, if I have my home and I move out and I begin renting it, I don't pay a fee. There's no grace period because there's no fee due because I haven't changed the ownership of the property. If after seven or eight years, 
of it being a rental, I decide to sell it, um, depending on how the bylaw is written, depends on whether that uh, a fee would be due at that point and whether it would be the full fee or half of a fee um, because of my side versus the buyer's side. It would all depend on how the bylaw is written, but there would be no fee upon change of use because change of use is not um, the criteria for determining the fee and the payment of the fee, it's change of ownership. Any questions on that one? See none, um, I'll move on to eight, which was the homestead exemption. Sean answered that there's no quick way of doing it. We said, we don't know, but we did think about some examples where there may not be a homestead exemption by an owner occupied property. Um, and the example we would give is my neighbor who owns the property and occupies it about seven or eight weeks a year. Um, because it's a second home. And once every six to eight weeks, uh, the owner comes in and visits and then leaves and no one occupies it the rest of the year. Um, it's still owner occupied, but since it's a second home, it probably does not have a homestead exemption. I don't know whether it does, but our guess would be that that's an example of owner occupied homes that do not have homestead exemptions, second homes. Um, that's the best we could do with number eight. Um, and with that, I'll move on to number nine, which was a question about Senator Comerford and Representative Dom, knowing that um, we, as a, that this sp proposed special act retains the option not to enact the bylaw should the legislation be enacted. And the answer to that is they are aware of that. Um, we are not the only um, community whose special act proposal operates that way instead of operating with an automatic um, institution of the transfer fee upon adoption or upon third, most of them, if they do it at that, without that option, they do it effective 60 days or 120 days or after the special act passes and is signed by the governor. Um, but that's only a subset of the number of special acts. We are in the other subset that have the acts effective immediately, but require further council um, action or town meeting action to actually institute the fee because the fee is up to a certain amount and is determined by future bylaw. Any questions uh, to follow up on what's been presented in response to the questions we assembled in advance? If not, are there other questions that members of the committee have or comments that members of the committee have at this point? Kathy. Um, I, let me just try and figure out how to frame it. Mandy, um, I appreciate that the this is as general as we can be um, to get approval for this. Do you anticipate um, a pushback from we have not put in that we would exempt any property under X, you know, this would only apply to transfers of properties over X or Y or whatever the threshold, because one of the things you said that are in the places that have done this they had that feature. So I don't know whether there's a way to get a reading. Um, I think that's a good idea. So I'm not advocating putting it in. And I certainly think when we talk about it at the council level or public level, we should say that's the intent in the bylaw to do that as you as you have. So it's, it's really a question of what we haven't put in the bylaw. Will we, will we be... Um, challenge. So for example, that people don't want the transfer fee to apply to uh, not that we're selling any properties in Amherst with houses on them of $200,000 or $150,000, you know, that they want some minimum threshold that it wouldn't apply to. Um, so, so that's a question. And then, uh, you know, I don't know where farms come in, 
you know, all of this. So is the way this is framed. Um, and again, farms don't often change hands as farms. Um, you know, they, but would, would our bylaw protect farmers if one farm wants to change to another ownership? I know this language said if it's a son, daughter, a cousin's inheriting the farm, that would be fine. So th those are just two separate places that if we don't have to be specific in the this, that's fine. But if we get asked about um, impact in Amherst, um, I want to be able to have answers to. I think, Mandy, if I can um, jump in really quickly, yeah. I think something uh, on your first question, you know, Joe, Mindy, Mandy, and myself, God, that's a hard sentence, is um, <laughs> we've been in regular contact regarding this. And I know Mindy specifically is, is speaking to some of the legislators who have brought this forward for other towns. Um, so, you know, they've been very well appraised of our, of our process and our progress. Um, and, and I think that if things come up that they, they, they want the home rules that we want to pass to pass, right? And so I think that if something comes up in, in their conversations with other legislators that they're going to tell us, hey, take this into consideration, we will, we will bring that back to the council, right, um, before it's passed. Um, and so we'll, we'll definitely bring that forward to them in terms of, do you see a problem with the way that we're doing this, not having a minimum in there, it specified in the special act, um, but thus far it hasn't been an issue. Um, the second part of your question, ooh, anybody else struggling with that five hours of sleep thing? Um, the second part of your question, oh, farms. So um, the, the farm question, I mean, that could be something that we specify in the bylaw. It could be either by zoning type, it could be um, if it has a, as a agricultural restriction. I think that there are opportunities in the bylaw to exempt farms if that's something that the, the council ultimately believes should be part of that bylaw. Mandy, did I miss anything? Um, no, I was gonna say the same thing about farms. Um, I think that would depend on how they're categorized as, as Anna was saying and something we could deal with in the bylaw. Um, but I, I wanted to say, um, so there are a couple of special acts. Our, our um, special act that does not put in exemptions, say, over certain thresholds is not unusual um, for the special acts in, in the state house that were in the state house last session. Um, we're in the process of refiling, right? Many people are refiling if they have to refile the special acts. But, um, but for example, Brookline has... Um, you know, they do have a first 500,000 would be exempted from the fee. But when you look at Arlington, Arlington's is um, transfers for less than 50% to 150% of the state medium sale as determined, you know, are exempt. So there's ranges in some of these, right? Um, and so not every special act um, has a specific range. Um, Provincetown, from what I can briefly, I, I'm trying to go through some of these quickly, has no range. Um, theirs is equal to a half a percent on the purchase of transfer of any real property interest in any property situated in the town of P-Town, and then they do some exemptions. Um, but their basic first sentence is the same as our first sentence in our special act. So it, it it's, it's not an unusual thing to not put in something because some do it, some special acts are there for, um, a, a, to try and impose a transfer fee over a certain threshold, um, like, you know, in so 200% of AMI or something like that. But other transfer fee special acts have been put in not to impose a, a transfer fee for properties that cost or sell, sell for over a certain threshold, they've put it in for properties that are not owner occupied, no matter the threshold. So it really just depends on what each individual town's goal has been, and Anna's and, and I's goal is to sort of do a combination of those two, the non-occupieds at any threshold and um, owner-occupieds or any, any residential above a certain threshold. And so that's why we've left it so general, but it just depends on what each town has been doing. And that's, it, that's the bylaw has. side of it, not that's and not that's, the- Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Um, these are 
maybe questions for down the road, but they come up from different circumstances I've observed. In section two, you talk about um, exempting uh, transfers to or from uh, the federal government, the Commonwealth, the town or entities and so forth. In the town of Amherst, I'm aware of at least one property, I don't know what its value is, that was given to the um, university. Now, that's a gift, but it was you know, a very worthwhile gift and it took it off the tax rolls. And, um, you know, it's, it's there. I'm, I'm also aware of another property that the people who live there intend upon their um, demise to also give it to the university. And at what point do these properties that may have seriously high value, are, you know, it sounds as if they would be exempt. And yet not only are they being transferred to a nonprofit and being taken off the tax rolls, but they're high value properties that we will therefore not get this fee for at all. So that's my first question. Um, so I'll, I'll try to tackle that one. Um, a good one. We did not come across a single special act that was proposed that did not have this full out exemption in about transfers to or from the federal government or the Commonwealth, um, let alone municipalities and all. Um, and so it is our belief that without that exemption in there, our special act would have absolutely no chance of passing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because, right. you know, the state's the state, right? They don't want to pay fees to municipalities no matter why. Yeah, I, I, it's it's an interesting, I'm going to say it, loophole, okay? Yeah, and um, I, I'm curious what other measures separate from this might be approached, but I think that, like Mandy said, it needs to be separate from the special act because I, I don't think that we're, I mean, this is already a tough one at the state level, right? We're, we're fighting a lot. So it's, I think keeping that in there for now is going to be necessary. And the second question, which goes directly... I mean, it's straightforward. Our son has a special needs trust. Upon our demise or the sale of our home, the proceeds of that will go to the special needs trust. I don't normally you know, discuss my estate issues with people, but uh, I have no idea whether our house at this point or in the future will fall under this law. But what you basically are saying to me is, since it's not going to transfer him to him directly, because the property won't remain in the trust, that I'm we're going to have to deduct from that what we're going to transfer to the trust. Is that correct? It is. I'm trying to find the section that I think Mandy is looking for at the same time, and it's, she's not on her phone. Um, yeah. It's uh, under six, it gets into real property. The Actually, I, I should pause just for a second. My intent was is that when we got past general questions that we would uh, need to pull up the um, proposed uh, special okay. legislation and actually put it on the screen and yep. discuss it section by section. So, because if we're going to recommend it, I think that the committee has to focus on it. It's only two pages of uh, for that. Right. So, <laughs> I'm gonna, just really quickly, um, I'm going to jump on now that I'm home on my computer. So, Sean, I'll be back in a second. Will you let me in from the audience again? And, and what I would say to you, Lynn, is that's an exemption that's in the, you know, I wouldn't even call it a draft bylaw, a sample bylaw. Um, and, and you are right, it's in the sample bylaw, it's under D16, I'm not sure why our numbering is kind of weird like that. Um, um, it's not something that's dealt with in the special act, so it's something that could probably be, um, again, discussed in more detail. I, you know, the way I read six, I don't actually know the answer to it because I'm not a trust and estate lawyer, but I would actually say number six might cover your situation, potentially. Um, 
right you know sort of already in there for thoughts like that but um we'd have to delve into the actual language that is uh, potentially already being considered as part of this sample that we put forward of intention um to answer that but that's the bylaw side that's not the special act side yeah i mean in many ways this builds on an issue that bob has raised from the beginning you know i I bought a home many years ago. It's basically my major asset. I now need to sell that home because I'm moving into Applewood or whatever the case may be. And what you've basically done is taxed my major asset. So it's in that category. Thank you. Oh, and I know that that's a, that's a tough one. And I think that, you know, there's so many different soapboxes we could go down about how that exact problem is totally screwing up our whole real estate market nationwide. But I think that um, it that is the reality. And it's still, I would, my argument would be that the vast majority of sales that would fall under this are still significant assets for their um, sellers, despite a one or 2% fee. Um, that would be, that would be my argument. And, I, but I recognize that that is a, that is a tough part for, of this for people. I want to make sure I have the right. Yeah, this is the one that Andy sent me, and also I think. Um, I think it is the revised one. Um, you know, can, you can tell if you look at section uh, three. Yeah. Uh, yep, it's the right. The it's the correct one. Oh, that is yeah. the correct one. It is because section three has the change that the housing trust yeah. requested, yeah. And that which, be which is a topic that I want to discuss and focus on when we get there but uh why don't we go back up to the top if we're getting if we're making this shift and see if there's any questions about introductory two paragraphs or um, section one and we'll just uh give a moment for committee members to review it again and then uh i'll look for hands Kathy. So I, I, uh, I don't really have questions on the special act, um, and you know I've raised them. I think the explaining any of this to our Amherst residents um, has much more to do with what the possible bylaw might be. So even, you know, the question Lynn just raised, if I look at your special act section two, the last little Roman numeral five is transfers between family members as may be defined by bylaw. You know, that if you're, you're trying to make sure your kids get your house or the value of your house, whether they are gonna live in the house or just sell the house then. Um, but I, I, I think, these are the kind of questions we're going to be getting in terms of um, how much am I protected or not protected. And I actually do agree with you, Anna, that the, the percent we're talking about is not going to so dilute the value of that asset that it stops that from happening. Um, so I, I think so I'll stop there. So it's the special act. And my understanding is we have to move soon on the special act and we can go on forever on the contents of the bylaw, which may well happen in terms of reaching any agreement on what the contents are. So it's because that's where people are going to really be pushing for a higher threshold, pushing for more exemptions, um, deciding whether we come in at two or whether we come in at half a percent, you know, uh, all of all of all of the above. So I'm just going to stop there because I think this I, I agree at the general the generalness of the way this is written. And um, as all of you know, I think the town needs money. So the um, allocating this directly piece of it to the affordable housing trust, I thought that was a good piece about it um, that we would be this is trying to make housing more affordable in Amherst um, is good. So I will we'll stop. I'm in favor of this as written. Does 
So I'm going to go on to credit to section three, and we'll uh, somebody has a question about one or uh, before three. Bob? Yeah, uh, I wanted to actually talk about section two um, and number Roman number four, four in there transfers with consideration under $100. First of all, I don't understand why that's there because it's $100 or less or uh, less than $100 transfer. Doesn't that, isn't that excluded in general? Um, and secondly, um, why $100? I mean, we just, uh, as part of our estate planning, uh, did a transfer for exactly $100. Um, we could have done it for $99, but we did it for 100. So. I don't understand why that's even in there. Um, so the list of exemptions in section two is basically the exact list that is in every um, special act we looked at. So all eight or nine of them, and they all had a hundred dollars. Um, so we went with what everyone else had. Um, I will say I had the same thought as you, Bob most of the sort of transfers for putting it into a trust, changing the trust, things like that are all $100, but but they all, every single special act had the consideration under $100. I believe it covered, the idea is that it's it covers the um, type of, of property transfers that are considered gifts. So when people do it for a dollar or, you know, um, or $99, like you said, I agree that 100 does feel like a, a pretty arbitrary number. Um, and I, I suppose that I don't have any problem with being flexible on, on that particular number. We can make it 101. Um, but I, I do believe that the intention there is to, to cover property transfers that are considered more of gifts. So, I, I mean, you'll look, if you look at our property transfer records, you'll see a number that were sold for a dollar. Not that many, but a few. Yeah, just so, uh, yeah, uh, that's what we did years ago. <laughs> yeah. And then when we did it recently, it was $100. So um, it's you know? a little arbitrary anyway. It, it is a little arbitrary. I think this is, this. the idea was that this covered most of what people typically would utilize when they were gifting property. But, but again, if you transfer for $100, you're not subject to any right. tax, right? I mean... So I think that the idea here is is that well I suppose if you were transferring to a non-owner uh, to a to be a rental this would this would exempt you because the way that we we wrote our sample bylaw hypothetically it's on the full purchase price so um, this could exempt folks who sell a rental property to another landlord for under a hundred dollars. Um, that would be the small gap that this creates. I think what this also does is shows the legislature that regardless of where we set our limit, we are exempting gifts of property under a certain amount. I'm calling them gifts because I feel like that's my understanding of why someone would do this. But uh, I think this is to say, because we're allowing ourselves regulation by bylaw, we are, we're still going to allow people to gift property. So, well, why not increase? Why not increase it to some nominal amount? Well, what I was going to say is we could leave the hundred in here because it's the standard language um, of every special act we've looked at. But it does not prohibit us in the bylaw from turning that number from one hundred to two hundred. We can't lower it from one hundred to ninety nine, but the bylaw could increase it from one hundred to two hundred, or from up to five hundred, or some number that track some sort of inflation as things as Bob said it used to be a lot of times they were a dollar and now they seem to be standardized at a hundred for some reason right um and so it could track that in the bylaw it would never be able to go less than a hundred so whatever number is put in here it can never go less than that uh, right. but it could always go higher than that yeah in a bylaw Bob, do you have a, a number in mind that you think would that's that's coming? I'm curious if if 100 feels too low. If there's something it's, that it just it just doesn't make any sense. It would not be subjected. You're saying the sale price is 100. dollars It makes no sense. It, it it's like it's throwing something in there that's completely irrelevant. 
Yeah, I, I think it's a reassurance to the legislature, to be honest. I, I, that's my understanding because they aren't seeing our bylaw. But I, I do understand how it could be perceived as not relevant. I mean, you're just going to change everybody to gifting to, to $99 rather than $100. I mean, it, it's it's just an arbitrary number and it makes no sense. That's all. <laughs> I understand your your issue with how the, it's worded with the state and that's fine. But, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just make sure everybody understands this. So, I mean, what would happen if there if you had a gift for a hundred dollars? Would you would you tax the entire price? You know, would, it would, would be a two dollar tax if it, it didn't a... get exempted from some other reason in the bylaw. Watch out, Sean! That capital improvement fund it's going to get hit with two dollars everywhere. But yeah, yeah that's correct. But if it were, but if it were an in if most likely, like you said, it would be exempted elsewhere. It would have to fit that specific niche in order to apply. There's the other question is, uh, what is the cost in staff time and other expenses in the finance department to collect a $2 fee? I think that, you know, my estimate is that the likelihood of folks selling what is a revenue generator for them in a rental property <clears throat> to someone else who is going to utilize it as a revenue generator for under a hundred dollars will happen very infrequently. Um, and so, you know, I, I mean, I think we can, I think it's a really interesting hypothetical, but I think the reality is that this will not happen often. Um, and so I, I don't actually think that the staff time for collecting those specific fees who have managed to not be exempt through any other way um, will, will be that great. Andy. Um, yeah. On this issue, Bernie may also. So what I'm gathering is this section two, the way you've written it, is very similar to what you've seen in other municipalities. Yes. And so in some ways, it's like we're coming into the legislature with basically sections of this that we think are going to be common across all of them. It takes away that negotiation piece and leaves open possibly other negotiation pieces. Which, and I don't wanna discount the importance of that when um, you know this type of home rule is, I mean, there's no easy home rule, we've, we've seen that, right? Um, but I think showing that there are commonalities and that it's important that each, each community has slightly different needs is really important. So having a, having a general foundation and underpinning that legislators have seen before that they're familiar with, it helps. And th that's my opinion, but I, I believe it helps, will help. And, and I would just say, as I said, we can't, if you look at the last paragraph of section two, we can't eliminate or reduce these exemptions, but we can increase them so that 100 can, when we're looking at a bylaw to actually enact, impose the fee, it could be turned to, as Andy said, 10,000 because of costs to implement a fee that's under 10,000, right? And, Again, it goes to the bylaw. Okay. Bernie? Uh, I want to start by saying I, I got my law education from uh, Google University. Um, and, uh, and I'm not a lawyer, so pour salt on this. But I believe the answer to this question is somewhere in general law, chapter 64D, which governs paying transfer taxes. So um, if um, uh, you know the 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 if the the, the uh, uh, people want to go ahead and check that or talk to someone who does a lot of uh, property law, uh, that would be helpful. So if it doesn't make any sense, it's probably because it's buried in the general laws. And if you want something, um, you need to pay attention to the general laws. You, you can't violate those in any special act. So my guess is if if we're we've got the under hundred dollars there, it's because it nods to chapter sixty four D. It's a really good point, Bernie. I um I don't know that off the top of your head. We went to the same uh, law school, so I will um I'll confirm that though. Okay. Um going to move on a second to section three and uh, we keep referring to other 
communities that have these and uh, I still haven't sent the uh, ah, sorry, document Andy. you were going to send. Uh, are there towns, cities or towns that already have special legislation and have enacted a, uh, a program for a real estate transfer fee or is it still all pending legislation, uh, special act requests? I believe that um, the the successful one has been Nantucket, but it was a slightly different one where they um, created a transfer fee that goes to a land bank. So it's much more for conservation versus housing. Um, that's my understanding. I believe this is still very much uh, the the good fight at the state level. Mandy, do you have a different understanding? That, that's my understanding too. So if nobody, no towns we can really talk to about their experience at administering a program. Um, section three. Well, hang on, uh, sorry, just just if I can briefly, Andy. Oh my gosh, sorry, my computer has been so glitchy. Um, while there are no necessarily within, none within Massachusetts, um, if folks are interested, this is something that's very common around the country. And so there are areas that uh, there are cities across the US that have done this and could be, oh, sorry, I look like an old TV show, could be um, spoken to. And I can try to, I can try to pull some um, if you, if you'd really like me to, but this is not something that is unique to Massachusetts. And in fact, in other states, it's very, in some other states, it's very commonplace. Okay, that's helpful. I don't know if, uh, I think at this point, I would, care more about that when we get to the bylaw stage, if we yeah. have the permission to get to the bylaw stage. And that the goal right now is to see if we can come to agreement on special legislation to file that would get us there. Um, so it's, I don't think that it's an issue that needs to come up right away. Um, section three, I have, uh, I guess, strong disagreement with uh, the uh, with the affordable housing trust has suggested because I think it uh, is important for us to recognize what Kathy has been saying all along about the gen the the extent of the problems that exist within uh, the town in not having revenue growth that in, in the consequences which affect all that we do, including affordable housing, but everything else that we do, and including education, for example. And so I uh, feel like uh, we have um, already in the special act by allocating a portion that is named uh, but and I, I just don't like the idea of having it included in the uh, section for additional funds. I think that is always available to the council and uh, the council can, can, can make any appropriate appropriation, but that uh, I don't know that uh, uh, calling it out um, is fair to all of the other needs within the community. And uh, it's, uh, you know, a, an advocate group that is speaking from a particular um, perspective, but, uh, you know, there are lots of others that could make that request and do it validly, like um, our schools. So, so I, I just want to say that I am concerned about that. Yeah, I, I, I hear that concern, Andy. I think um, my most recent conversations specifically with Mindy about this really are emphasizing the need to keep it in. We are one of, I believe, if only a few that are including allocations outside of the trust. So many of the special acts that have been filed have the entirety of the revenue going automatically to the housing trust. Um, I agree with you that we have much stronger, well, no, we have other pressing needs in Amherst where this revenue would be very necessary. But my concern is actually just in keeping those in there at all and having the legislature be okay with it. Um, 
And so my, I think that having the housing trust be one of the three that it could be, and again, we by bylaw determine that split, um, which is important to note. I think this, that gives us more of a, of a chance because of how strongly these have been tied to housing because they have to do with housing. So while I, I understand where you're coming from, especially, you know, I think that there's no reason why general funds couldn't go to housing. I, I think that there's, there's a really strong case for keeping it in there um, in terms of demonstrating that this is uh, a really important element about this is, is stabilizing and increasing affordable opportunities. Yeah, I, um, I guess I don't like the idea of it being done by bylaw. I think it should be done by annual appropriation. And uh, but let's go on and have a uh, broader conversation, Matt. Hands. Thanks, Andy. And yeah, this is a, a very broad question. And um, Anna and, and uh, um, others, I really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. And I think it is, a, you know, potentially a really great revenue stream. Um, and and I'm just going to give my and I I really just I don't have a great understanding of the entire bylaw, so uh, special legislation and, and bylaw. But but I want to just make sure that I'm understanding the. The core argument, which is, um, you know, that there is that concern about the cost being passed on to renters. And I want to make sure I understand that the core argument is that this is not a regressive um, fee or tax because uh, because most of our affordable housing, we, we see the renters who are most directly affected by this as not being renters who are accessing affordable housing, but folks who are accessing rental properties for other reasons. So I guess I'm, I'm kind of making an assumption here, which was in some of those questions that, that you know, this fee does get passed through into the rent. And so it does raise the rent on, on most rental property in town, um, you know, outside of a, the affordable housing zone. And so I guess I would ask, you know, first, um, if, that, if that's accurate, if that's how, you know, we're, we're characterizing this. Um, and then second, you know, I guess, you know, ultimately this is raising the rent on, the university grad students and undergrads um, and so you know what are some of the downstream implications of that um, you know have we talked to folks in the university who work on housing matters um, you know i don't know what are, what are some of the implications there in terms of our ongoing partnership with the universities uh, those are probably broad and probably have more assumptions baked into them than you know anybody's comfortable with but i just wanted to kind of put that out there as, as my that's kind of where my pondering sit um, right now Matt, I think it's interesting. Um, to your first point, I believe that the way we have drafted or the, the draft of our, I'm looking quickly. Um, do, 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 do. So, so we, number two, in section two, Roman numeral two, transfers of real property subject to an affordable housing restriction would be exempted from this. So yes, affordable um, anything that holds an affordable housing restriction would not be subjected to any sort of fee. Um, the second question is interesting. I think one, it, it, it does make the assumption and I, I challenge this assumption that this would lead to a rise in rents um, in, in over the course of, or, or across town. Um, and, and so I, I think, you know, when we look at that, like Mandy said earlier, 30 year um, or a one-time fee over a 30 year mortgage looks a lot different than an annual increase or an annual fee um, for the life of that mortgage. So I also think, you know, we, to be realistic, I think that um, this is a, uh, being a, being, having a rental property is, is a business in a lot of ways, right? It's a revenue generator for an individual or a few individuals. And so they're going to charge what they can charge. Um, regardless of, of <laughs> what we do in a lot of senses. And so I think that a one-time fee, while it may, well, it may impact, I think that that impact would be less, a lot less than if this were an annual, um, because if you look at a 1% or a 2% uh, fee of the, of a purchase price and spread it over 30 years, it's, it's very different than if you were looking at a 2% increase every year. Um, that was a little rambly, but I hope it, I hope it helps respond. Yeah, I agree with you, Anna. Uh, 
though I do want to point out that um, the Finance Committee may want to come back to this issue when we get into the question of fee proposals related, related to rental registration, mm -hmm. because um, that will be an ongoing fee as opposed to a one time. And uh, how landlords react to ongoing expenses as opposed to one time expenses is likely to be very different. Uh, I can't say it with certainty because I'm not in the business myself. There's no evidence of it, but uh, that is uh, something that we will need to reconsider uh, and, and, and return to at that point. Uh, Bernie, I see your hand up. Thanks, Andy. Um, I want to concur with uh, Andy's concerns about um, this being done by uh, by bylaw rather than by annual act of the the, the council. Uh, I also want to raise concerns that um, well, it's it's all well and good that we focus on affordable housing. Uh, there is because of the rental situation in town, there is an a, a explicit lack of affordable middle class housing. Uh, it's very difficult for young families to um, of, of reasonable means to, to relocate into Amherst uh, and 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 stay. And we can see that in terms of our, our dropping uh, our dropping school enrollments. So to refer back to the paper from the University of Kansas that was um, included in the questions, uh, that paper suggests that one of the ways that you can make property uh, more affordable is by uh, not privileging certain types of property and uh, raising using that to raise revenues that will then go to cover other expenses and in effect lower taxes. So money that isn't that this is collected here that's going to go offset offset capital needs will help uh, stabilize or maybe even miracles happen, uh, lower tax rates, uh, which would also benefit the, the renters. Um, I also think that we shouldn't assume that uh, because someone is renting that they're necessarily a low person of low income. Um, it could well be that, you, you know, not everybody um, not everybody feels compelled to own property, uh, for one. And for two, uh, there's a difference, I think, between someone who's settled into Amherst for the long term and is renting because they can't afford uh, to buy into uh, housing uh, against someone who's transient, who's here for uh, uh, three or four years and uh, is going to move on. So uh, that's, that'll get, I'll get off my soapbox now. Thank you. Andy, if I could just respond to that real quick, I, I certainly didn't, and I apologize if I miss, you know, if I came across the wrong way, I certainly did not mean to make any implication about what a renter is or is not in terms of their income level. I was pointing out what Anna helpfully clarified, which is, you know, that, that this is, uh, this explicitly sidesteps, you know, impacting affordable housing rent costs. That's the goal. One of the many goals. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I just wanted to respond to Andy and, and um, Bernie um, with, you know, I think this is one of the sections that Anna and I, and, and Anna will surely correct me if she doesn't believe the same thing, um, have said needs discussed and needs agreed upon. Um, we put it in the, we, we put the allocation originally between the stabilization fund and the general fund in a bylaw allocation so that that number could be modified and didn't have to always be say an even split or didn't always have to be 25 75 of remaining or something because once it's in the special act it's stuck um because we're just assuming if we get the special act passed through the legislature and the governor it's never changing <laughs> is the assumption we're operating on um and so that's why we put it there as a bylaw allocation. Uh, the AMAHT made some decent arguments as to why they should potentially have some potential share of that. Their goal would be a one third share. Um, I don't believe Anna and I ever agreed to that. Uh, we said that's a discussion for when a bylaw comes through. Um, 
what I would say is if finance wants something different or wants it out of the bylaw and into the special act, that is something that could be done and the language could be found. Um, you know, that's it. If finance wants that, finance recommends it out, right? Um, that way. I, I will say of the 10 communities um, that have filed special acts, um, one, two, three, four, five of them give it 100% to the housing trust. One gives it 100% to a housing fund for the purpose of creating and preserving affordable and or attainable housing in the town, which is up to 200% under their definition in the special act. Provin that was Chatham. Provincetown says 250,000 to the capital improvement stabilization fund with the remains to the general fund. So again, not, and, and Brookline is quote, projects related to affordable housing. Um, Wealth Fleet is 50,000 to the capital improvement stabilization fund remains to the housing trust. And then there's Boston. So of, of eight, eight of the 10, have no ability to change any of their allocations. They've put it in the special act specifically with no ability to change. Um, Brookline's got this projects related to affordable housing um, without where it goes other than that. And then there's Boston, which puts it all into the neighborhood trust unless by ordinance and then there's random wording that basically says, unless by ordinance, they do something else with, with else with it is how we summarized it um, for projects designed to address housing disparities. And they've got a whole list. So Boston also does it by ordinance, potentially. Um, that's the angle we took. If finance doesn't like it, um, we could, if finance could recommend a different way, um, but it would need to decide what the split is within the special act between the various options. Well, the first $250,000 is, uh, is, has been in the uh, proposed special act for a while, automatically going to the affordable housing trust you know, I, I think the question then obviously comes to the balance of above 250 in any given year. And frankly, I think it should go to the general fund for um, al uh, allocation by the council through the budget process as it deems appropriate, which can include the affordable housing trust to stabilization fund or other purpose. Is there a reason why we couldn't put in the bylaw that that would be revisited annually by the council, that that allocation would be revisited on an annual basis? The 250,000 or? No, the, the, you, we had talked, yeah, I mean, yes, and the general split. We had talked about it being regulated by bylaw, but you, Andy, you had said, that you know, your concern would be that it would be set by bylaw and then set. And I, I think if we could write something in any future bylaw that Lynn's got thoughts. Yeah, I mean, the bylaw, of course, is uh, whatever you put in in an allocation of bylaw, to change a bylaw is a more complex process. No, to change uh, a fee and a, and a division of a fee, sorry. I don't know, Kathy and Lynn, I think both have thoughts on this, so. Yeah. Um, John has his hand John, up. let's just go to Sean. This is a easy one, um, and I'm just checking to see if there's interest. Would it be helpful to know if the fee could be deposited in the Community Preservation Act Fund instead of the affordable housing? I, I don't know the answer to it, and I can find out if anyone is interested in that as an alternative to the housing trust. Um, obviously, if it went into the CPA fund and that's if that's allowable, that has the option to go to the housing trust at that point still, or it could be used for other CPA eligible purposes, but it would still go through a, it would still put it within a council, make it an annual decision, as opposed to being an automatic type thing. I would really caution the committee from moving more away from affordable housing. I think that the, 
the more that we push this away from funding going to affordable housing, the the more we are dropping its chances in the legislator mm -hmm. legislature. Okay. From, from my that's my understanding. But I appreciate that creative thinking, Sean. So I, I would say right now the sample bylaw has, you know, because it's a sample, the remaining funds collected each fiscal year shall be deposited in equal amounts into the town of Amherst Capital Improvement Stabilization Fund and, and general fund. As Anna was saying, some some sample bylaw or some future bylaw could could potentially say, um, could could figure out, or maybe the special act could say, you know, there's probably a way to say, um, Per, you know, something shall be deposited in the capital improvement. These these funds, um, in accordance with a council's annual budget, or some wording like that, could probably go into the bylaw instead of the way it says right now in the sample bylaw. Again, uh, would the sample bylaw go to the legislature as part of this process? I would have thought not. And not not in the intent right now. Just the special act would. So the sample bylaw would have to deal with all three um, if we leave the AMAHT in the second half of it. But Andy, just real quick on that same topic. Um, I think the discussion is about whether it should go into the capital stabilization fund or be general revenues at the discussion. Um, I mean, there's no shortage of capital needs, right? We we know there's going to be lots of capital needs in the future, um, and the council, if if it felt that the capital stabilization fund was building up too high because of this um, fee, it could always just decrease how much is available for capital in the from uh, for cash capital. So there's there's other mechanisms where the council, if they felt like we had plenty in the in the capital stabilization fund, which I don't think you ever will, um, <laughs> but if you ever did feel like there was plenty there. Um, the offset would be to look at how much we're putting in, into capital uh, on the cash capital side through um, the capital improvement program. Yeah, I think. Uh, yeah, I, Sean said most of what I was just gonna say that I, if we can, Mandy, if we can fix these draft bylaw language to leave some flexibility on this on annual, um, I think similarly, the way I think of the Affordable Housing Trust, seeing that it comes to CPA every year asking for 500,000, you know, if it was getting funded, it allows more CPA money for other needs. So this year it was cut back because of the way it interacted with two big housing people. So I think the funds are actually more fungible than um, this makes it look. I think this is a good selling point that we're trying to fund. This is a, about housing. And Andy, on the, you know, the allocation, if they can write the bylaw that way, um, since every year we're figuring out whether it's 8%, 9%, 10% of general revenues is going to capital, if there was another source that was funding capital, then the general fund gets a breather on this. I, I think we've got a lot of discretion because that's an annual decision. We, we haven't prejudged um, in perpetuity 10%, 10.5. So I feel like as long as the bylaw doesn't tie the hands, man, the actual bylaw, you know, doesn't say, you know, X percent, X percent, X percent allows as determined annually by the council. Um, I think that would be um, a much better way of going that the bylaw enables the flexibility. So that that's just my view, because I think it is a selling point, potentially even to the broader public, that we're, we're trying to stabilize housing in Amherst. We're not trying to make it more expensive. Um, so we'll stop there. Andy, I have my hand up. Yes. Uh, what I'm what I'm hearing, I, I keep focusing on the special legislation, and I realize that I haven't focused enough on the bylaw, but the reality is it's the special legislation that we need to move forward on. And in fact, um, 
I just I need to go back and check with Mindy, but um, they even want a placeholder filed as early as the 20th of this month. She said it's yeah. okay if we can get it to council ideally on the 23rd or, or the following meeting, okay. but there is no deadline for home rules specifically. Okay. Uh, the main thing is that I'm hearing from um, Mandy Jo and Anna, and that is that to be in the game of the um, discussion at the state level, this affordable housing stuff still needs to be present. That, but I think I, I'm actually very much in agreement with Andy's point of view about wanting the greatest flexibility each year to decide where things go. But that's a bylaw. I, I think the question really that we need to focus on is the sample legislation and what get, what puts it what will put us at the table at the state level that will allow us to be negotiating with our eastern mass uh, municipalities who are going to control the conversation and and the Cape obviously it's the eastern mass and the Cape. And the biggest element of that, Lynn, I'm sorry, if I can just respond for you, the most important element there is that it's not a hard number that we're looking above. Right. right. That's the biggest, most important piece. Right. But we want to be able to be at the table. So we want to get oh, absolutely. the legislation, our, our, our sample legislation filed so we can be at that table. Bernie? Yeah. Um, Andy's I, I, in I charge, think... but I saw your hand up. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> We're going to have a long time to talk about the bylaw if this is uh, because this is special legislation and this will go on for for more time than we all care to think about and i, I think lynn's point is uh, is right on target that we need to be we need to have something in the game and as long as uh, we under we all understand that there's a, a room for flexibility in the bylaw and i think honest point that there's no hard in fact uh, fast percentages here is a good one so we we should um, we should really move forward with the Yeah, I, I, I agree. And I've said that all along. Uh, actually, I have a suggestion as I keep looking at this and hearing the conversation, and that is just to change one word. Instead of saying as allocated by bylaw at the very end, saying as determined by bylaw. And that gives the um, arguable flexibility in developing the bylaw to not just do an allocation so much to each group, but um, actually to make a decision as to how that will the, that can be done on an annual basis and how it's done on an annual basis. It's a little bit more flexible, but it still keeps the ability to have the housing trust listed in that second portion, uh, since the feeling is, is that it will help sell the bylaw. Mandy? Um, I'm fine with that change. And I'm looking at the word and between Town of Amherst General Fund and the Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and wondering if, um, oh, it should probably say trust fund, but if the and should be and slash or which would give even more flexibility. So you want and? And or the Amherst Ash, Municipal Ash. Housing a Trust Fund. We forgot the word fund when we typed. I also just put an and slash or fund. And again, I forgot the word municipal up at the top three lines, the third line of section three, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So if there's, uh, I see Matt's uh, hand this up yet. Matt. Andy, I just wanted to ask if we are, um, if we have a defined end time for this meeting and if we're gonna move to a vote because I, I won't be able to stay much longer. Um, my goal is actually to get to a vote. And uh, I think that I don't have questions about the rest of it. Let me just uh, have it up on the screen for a second. See if there are other issues uh, with the language or suggestions, because if not, I think we can move to a vote and then uh, 
uh, dispose of other issues as uh, appropriate. So seeing none, then it would seem that the uh, what we really need at this point is a motion to recommend that the town council uh, propose a special act to the legislature as presented by the finance committee, um, which would be the um, version that is now been edited, or we could word it otherwise, um, but Lynn. I'm fine with that, so moved. Is there a second? Shane seconds. Okay, Bill. Yeah, can you just give me that wording again, Andy? Um, that the uh, finance committee recommends to the town council that it request the adoption of a special of special legislation. Uh, as presented by the committee in its report. Okay. So I think we can go ahead unless there's any other discussion that needs to happen. I'll put for hands for just a second while I get my uh, list of members up, Bob. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, if you can scroll down a little bit um, where we talk about the Hampshire County Registrar of Deeds um, is prohibited from recording. I, can we do that? That Hampshire Register, this is the end of section five. Can we tell the Hampshire Registrar of Deeds what they can or can't do? Well, it's, uh, the legislature would be telling the Hampshire okay. Registrar of <laughs> Deeds. Uh, Mandy or Anna, is that a common language in other proposed special legislation. It is. I think if we put it in our bylaw, then we'd have a problem, but it's in the special act, so it's from the state. So that's sufficient, Bob? That's fine. I, I just, okay. just want to make sure. Um, so, uh, Let's go to a vote and we'll, I'll do, I'll reverse the order this time and uh, start with Alicia. Abstain. Um, okay, going up from, uh, then I'm next and I go yes. Kathy? Yes. Michelle? Michelle's still with it. Michelle? I don't think Michelle's in the meeting anymore. I don't know when she left. Okay. I'm in the market as an absent for the vote. Bernie? Yes. Support. Matt? Support. Bob? Abstain. And Lynn? Aye. So the vote is three yes. One abstain, one absent from the voting members and support of three members so that the motion carries. Thank you. Thank so, you. Thank you, thank you all. I abstained. I did not. Bob, is, Bob abstained, abstained, Andy. Oh, Bob abstained. Okay. Let's make sure that we get that correct, but I'm going to need to change. Uh, Okay. So um, with that noted, um, I'm going to just uh, uh, go to the, uh, there is no public presence, so we I don't have to return to public comment. Um, I'm going to skip approval of minutes today because we're already past time. Um, 
next committee meeting. Uh, we know about Thursday uh, and uh, hope that all can attend. If not, uh, certainly it's going to be available for you to look at at a later time. If you have questions in advance of the meeting and you're not going to be able to attend, please send them to uh, Sean and to me, as I had indicated in the prior um, email to the committee. Um, and uh, I think that our next um, meeting is uh, the day after the next council meeting, as we've currently going, going, and it will be back to our afternoon hours. I think next council meeting, I believe, is the 23rd. And so it's the 24th would be the date for the next meeting. Is there any other um, business that people would like to request that was not anticipated in advance? Uh, just a quick note, Andy, that um, Lynn will have appointed members to the Finance Committee on the by the 23rd. And then the first order of business on the 24th would be um, the election of the uh, chair and vice chair. Thank you for the reminder. So uh, to our resident members, thank you very much for being here. Uh, we may or may not be with you depending upon who the president appoints to the committee, but we won't put pressure on her now to uh, indicate anything. And uh, so I don't think we have any other business and uh, Unless, if, since I see no hands up about unanticipated business requests, thank you very much. Uh, hope to see most of you or all of you on Thursday, and uh, if, and um, have a good day. Thank you. We're adjourned. Thanks.